Welcome everyone. Welcome to all of you joining us, our guests and our panelists, our participants from around the world. Uh, we have people joining us today from all over the world, so Latin America and Asia, and also from uh, the Global South today, many of you from the Global South, I believe. So this really is a truly international event uh, today and a very important one. Uh, so as you know, we are taking a look at a timely topic and a crucial one. We're gonna talk about the pandemic and uh, freedom of press and expression. And we're really happy to have have you take part in our discussion today. Uh, just some housekeeping notes, one rather. Uh, all of you have are joining us likely received an email with an invitation with some details also about languages. So our program today will take part in English and in German. And if you need a translation, uh, there were some details in that email about the English channel that will be running during the German portions, if you need that translation. Uh, that information is also in the chat here on the live stream. So you can look in there to find out how to access that translation if you need it uh, for the German portions uh, of our program. But let's get right to our topic today, because we have a lot to discuss and a lot to look at. Uh, fair and critical journalism, why it is more important than ever uh, during this pandemic. We have a little uh, taste of this for you. Let's take a look. 150 million infected, more than 3 million dead. The coronavirus is changing our lives. People are feeling unsettled, which is why they are looking for clarity and reliable information. Independent media is essential for survival, especially at the local level, where journalists are not only telling people to wash their hands, but also where to find clean water. But censorship and disinformation spread as fast as the virus itself. There are opponents who are trampling on the freedom of the press around the world during the pandemic. And this is a threat to democracy. The economic crisis is threatening the media's independence and its very existence. What can we learn from the pandemic? The answers to our current challenges must be met with journalistic expertise, relevance and transparency. It's time for us to build and maintain stable media ecosystems. Good journalism, relevance and transparency matter. Strong media can help overcome crises now and in the future. Information saves lives. All right, that gives us a very good opening, uh, I'd say, taste to what we're discussing today. Uh, we heard there it's time for us to build and maintain stable media ecosystems and that media is very important. And you see all the people on our screen right here because we're going to have a very dynamic discussion today. Uh, later on, uh, a little bit later in this program, we'll be talking to key stakeholders and uh, have some expert opinion also and hear from uh, some initiatives on the ground. So we'll have a, a dynamic conversation, as I said, to, to get some of the grassroots aspect of why it is important to protect media and uh, promote free and uh, free and independent media and how we can do so. So, so uh, we will be doing that a little bit later in the program. Please do stay tuned for that. But first, we want to start with a very important initiative to battle mis- and disinformation in the pandemic. And this is an in uh, initiative that's been launched by the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And DW is also getting to put this initiative uh, into practice. So we're going to hear about both of those right now. And to start us off, we have uh, the Parliamentary State Secretary from the Ministry with us, Mr. Norbert Bartle. And then after that, we will hear from the Director General of uh, DW, Peter Limburg, who you also see on your screen here uh, to talk about DW's part uh, that in, in this initiative. So first of all, herzlich willkommen, Herr Bartler. Wir freuen uns auf Ihre Ausführungen zur Bewältigung dieser Informationspandemie. Ja, vielen Dank, uh, Sumi Sommerskanda, uh, sehr geehrter Herr Limburg, sehr geehrte Frau und Dr. Bryant, Exzellenzen, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, auch von mir ein herzliches Willkommen. Unser heutiges Thema ist äh, mir auch als Mitglied im Rundfunkrat der Deutschen Welle ein ganz persönliches Anliegen. Die Bedeutung von Medien in der Pandemie. Starke Mediensysteme von heute sind sozusagen der Impfstoff von morgen. Und zwar gegen Fake News, gegen Desinformation und auch gegen die Ausbreitung von Corona. Denn Informationen retten Leben. 
Um die Corona-Pandemie zu bekämpfen, braucht es verlässliche Informationen. Um fundierte Entscheidungen treffen zu können, müssen sie faktenbasiert sein, vor allem in schwierigen Situationen. Ohne Medien, die diese Informationen bereitstellen, ist die Krise nicht zu bewältigen. Freie Berichterstattung zählt zur DNA jeder Demokratie. Und das Recht, sich frei zu informieren und mitzuteilen, ist ein Menschenrecht. Der Einsatz dafür lohnt sich immer. Und daran erinnert uns vor drei Tagen der Internationale Tag der Pressefreiheit. Doch die Herausforderungen für die Wahrung dieses Menschenrechts, für die Medienfreiheit, sind groß. Das zeigt der aktuelle Bericht von Reporter ohne Grenzen. In nur noch zwölf von 180 Ländern herrscht eine gute Situation der Medienfreiheit, so wenige Länder wie noch nie. In fast drei Viertel aller Länder wird unabhängiger Journalismus blockiert oder ernsthaft behindert. Und im vergangenen Jahr wurden so viele Übergriffe auf Medienschaffende gezählt wie noch nie, auch bei uns. Repressive Regime missbrauchen die Corona-Krise, um die Medien- und Meinungsfreiheit weiter einzuschränken. Und so ist die Pandemie auch in ihrem zweiten Jahr eine Krise der unabhängigen Medien. Die WHO spricht von einer Infodemie, liebe Frau Bryant. Ich habe Fake News schon erwähnt. Mediennutzerinnen und Nutzer sehen sich zunehmend mit Falschinformationen und Gerüchten konfrontiert, zum Beispiel, wie sie sich während der Pandemie verhalten sollen. Das kann verheerende Folgen haben. Menschen brauchen das Wissen, wie sie Falschmeldungen von verlässlichen Informationen unterscheiden, also Medienkompetenz. In vielen Ländern sind insbesondere die ländlichen Regionen von der Krisenkommunikation abgeschnitten. Die Folge, ganze Bevölkerungsgruppen können sich nicht über Wege aus der Krise informieren und auch ihre eigenen Anliegen nicht wirksam zum Ausdruck bringen. Deshalb sind unabhängige Medien in ihrer wirtschaftlichen Existenz bedroht. Die Anzeigenmärkte brechen ein, Journalistinnen und Journalisten werden entlassen, Fachwissen und finanzielle Ressourcen fehlen, gerade im Gesundheitsbereich. Was können wir also tun? Die gute Nachricht ist viel und das sogar wirksam. So startet zum Beispiel die deutsche Entwicklungszusammenarbeit in diesem Jahr die globale Initiative Transparenz und Medienfreiheit, Krisenresilienz in der globalen Pandemie. Ziel ist, gemeinsam mit unseren Partnern, mit der Deutschen Welle Akademie, Herr Limburg und Mediennichtregierungsorganisationen wie Reporter ohne Grenzen, die Widerstandsfähigkeit von lokalen Medien und ihre Rolle als Aufklärer zu stärken, damit sie auch in der Krise verlässliche Informationen und den Zugang dazu gewährleisten können. Die länderübergreifende Initiative ist Teil des Corona-Sofortprogramms meines Ministeriums. Sie setzt drei Schwerpunkte mit gezielt an die Bedarfe vor Ort angepassten Vorhaben. Erstens unterstützen wir unabhängige Lokal- und Bürgermedien, wie zum Beispiel Radiosender. So können sie innovative Aufklärungsformate und Geschäftsstrategien entwickeln. Und dazu gehören die gezielte Nutzung von sozialen Medien, die Einrichtung digitaler Redaktionsplattformen in Afrika und Lateinamerika, der Aufbau einer Allianz zum Faktencheck in Asien, aber auch Beratung und Qualifizierung zur Berichterstattung im Gesundheitsbereich. Partnermedien in Mexiko, Bolivien, Ecuador, Guatemala stellen zum Beispiel Informationen über Covid-19 auch in indigenen Sprachen zur Verfügung. Und zweitens verbessern wir die Rahmenbedingungen für eine effektive Corona-Aufklärung und Krisenkommunikation. Dazu unterstützen wir den Aufbau von Informations- und Kommunikationsforen. Staatliche, zivilgesellschaftliche und mediale Akteure können dadurch erstmals gemeinsames Krisenmanagement betreiben 
wodurch sich auch die Krisenkommunikation von örtlichen Behörden oder Flüchtlingslagern, wie zum Beispiel im Flüchtlingscamp Cox Bazar in Bangladesch, verbessert. Dort unterstützt die De Deutsche Welle Akademie lokale Ra Radiosender dabei, im Camp und den umliegenden Gemeinden über Corona aufzuklären. Und drittens stärken wir junge Menschen im kompetenten Umgang mit Medien, denn sie sind über soziale Medien besonders häufig Falschmeldungen und Fehlinformationen ausgesetzt. Unsere Partnerorganisationen in Nahost und Lateinamerika entwickeln Curricula für die Vermittlung von Medienkompetenz. Inhalte werden dann auch über Messenger-Dienste wie WhatsApp verbreitet. Meine Damen und Herren, ich wiederhole es. Ohne Medien keine Krisenbewältigung. Deshalb unterstützen wir die Medien in unseren Partnerländern mit dieser Initiative dabei, krisenfester zu werden. Kurzfristig in der Pandemie, langfristig, aber auch mit Blick auf weitere Herausforderungen, wie zum Beispiel den Klimawandel, Flucht, und Migration oder gewaltsame Konflikte. Dafür stellt das BMZ in diesem Jahr insgesamt 40 Millionen Euro zur Verfügung, davon 10 Millionen Euro für die neue Medieninitiative. Globale Krisen bewältigen wir nur global und gemeinsam. Der Einsatz für freie Medien, journalistische Qualität und Medienkompetenz ist selten einfach. Oft riskant, aber immer nötig. Dafür wünsche ich uns allen Ausdauer, Kraft und natürlich Gesundheit. Vielen herzlichen Dank. Vielen Dank, Herr Bartle. Thank you very much for explaining this initiative, uh, why it's important, and also highlighting local and citizen-driven journalism. That's actually something we're going to pick up upon uh, in our panel a little bit later when we look at some of those grassroots efforts. So thank you for setting that up for us so well. And as I mentioned, DW gets to put this initiative into practice. So we're going to turn to DW's Director General, Peter Limburg, now for more on the role that DW is playing to really fight this uh, infodemic. So, uh, herzlich willkommen, Herr Limburg. Ja, vielen Dank, Sumi, für die nette Einleitung. Und äh, vielen Dank, äh, Herr Bartle, für äh, Ihre Worte. Und ich glaube, äh, diese Initiative ist wirklich sehr hilfreich. Und äh, das Gute an Initiativen und äh, an Projekten, wo man Medien mit eben fördert, ist, dass man so viele Menschen mit erreichen kann und eine wirklich große und durchschlagende Wirkung erzielen kann. Diese Initiative äh, ist für die Deutsche Welle Akademie sehr wichtig. Mit Partnern in 16 Ländern wird sie umgesetzt in, für Projekte in Afrika, in Asien, Osteuropa, Lateinamerika und der MENA-Region. Insgesamt sind wir im Rahmen dieser Initiative in 33 Ländern aktiv. Die Projekte der Deutschen Welle Akademie sollen dazu beitragen, das Überleben der Medien in der Corona-Krise nachhaltig zu stärken. Der Staatssekretär hat es gerade angesprochen. Es ist tatsächlich eine sehr, sehr schwierige Lage für so viele Medienhäuser um in der gesamten Welt. Ein Schwerpunkt unserer Projekte ist die Stärkung des Wissenschaftsjournalismus. Wir unterstützen zum Beispiel in Kolumbien, Ecuador und Peru den Aufbau von digitalen Fortbildungsangeboten und fördern aktiv die Vernetzung zwischen Wissenschaftlern, professionellen Journalisten, aber auch Bürgerjournalisten. So halten mehr Menschen verständliche und fundierte Informationen, um sich selbst und ihre Familie besser vor der Pandemie zu schützen. Dabei sind uns marginalisierte Bevölkerungsgruppen ein großes Anliegen, wie zum Beispiel indigene oder eben geflüchtete Menschen. Die Öffentlichkeit muss sich ganz besonders bei einer Nachrichtenlage mit globaler Auswirkung auf Informationen, Einordnung und Erklärung durch die Medien verlassen können. Die Presse muss daher zusätzlich zu einer fundierten Berichterstattung dringend auch gegen Desinformation vorgehen. Gerade in den sozialen Medien finden sich viele falsche Informationen über die Corona-Pandemie, denen manche Menschen leider zu viel Glauben schenken. Ich bin aber auch sehr froh, dass gerade im letzten Jahr die Berichterstattung der Deutschen Welle weltweit enorm stark genutzt wird und wurde. Wir verzeichnen mittlerweile jeden Monat mehr als eine Milliarde Zugriffe auf unsere digitalen Angebote. 
wir tragen Verantwortung für die Menschen, die bei der Deutschen Welle arbeiten. Es ist also unsere Aufgabe, unsere Journalisten und Journalistinnen zu schützen und sie in die Lage zu versetzen, über diese bisher einmalige Pandemie berichten zu können. Es ist dabei nicht immer leicht, jedes Risiko auszuschließen. Auch unsere Reporter sind in einigen Ländern bei der Arbeit behindert worden. Letztes Jahr hat die Deutsche Welle ihren Freedom of Speech Award allen Journalisten und Journalistinnen weltweit gewidmet, die über Covid-19 berichtet haben. Trotz eines hohen Risikos für sich selbst. Wir wissen, dass beispielsweise in China Journalistinnen verhaftet wurden oder einfach spurlos verschwunden sind. Aber auch in Afrika wurden Journalisten und Journalistinnen stark behindert und eingeschüchtert. So ist beispielsweise am letzten Wochenende unsere Ostafrika-Korrespondentin Marielle Müller in Kenia von der Polizei mit Tränengaspatronen beschossen worden. Sie wurde am Bein verletzt und sie hat eigentlich nur eine friedliche Demonstration von Protestierenden, die sich gegen die Lockdown-Maßnahmen der Regierung gewandt haben, hat sie einfach nur darüber berichtet und ein Interview gemacht. Und leider sieht es eben in vielen Ländern, auch in Europa mittlerweile, schwierig aus, was die Pressefreiheit angeht. Einige Regierungen setzen alles daran, um die Wahrheit über die Auswirkungen des Virus und ihr eigenes Versagen bei der Bekämpfung der Pandemie zu unterdrücken. Journalisten und manchmal die Medien insgesamt werden zur Zielscheibe von Diffamierung und Opfer von staatlicher Willkür. Das funktioniert über Ausgrenzung und Einschüchterung. Es gibt auch Fälle, in denen unabhängigen regierungskritischen Medien die finanzielle Grund entzogen wurde. Das ist mehr in einer Hinsicht nicht hinnehmbar. Wir müssen uns vergegenwärtigen, dass freier Journalismus in dieser Pandemie sprichwörtlich Leben retten kann. Wir werden aber auch nach dieser Pandemie glaube ich, sehr viel Arbeit haben bei der Deutschen Welle Akademie. Denn Staatssekretär Bartler hat es angesprochen, viele Medienunternehmen sind in schwierigen Wasser. Sie haben große Einkommensverluste und dadurch ist eben freier Journalismus bedroht, wenn Medien heute nicht geht oder sie ihre Arbeit einstellen müssen. Deswegen brauchen wir auch weiterhin die Unterstützung des BMZ, das sich so ähm, sehr stark engagiert, auch eben für die Deutsche Welle Akademie, für Medienfreiheit und Pressefreiheit. Die Verbreitung von glaubwürdigen Informationen über alle Gesen hinweg ist der einzig richtige Weg in der Situation, in der sich die gesamte Welt momentan befindet. Freie Medien sind ein tragendes Element für eine freie und gesunde Gesellschaft. Vielen Dank. Thank you, Mr. Lernberg. Thank you very much for that look at how DW is supporting uh, fact-based, reliable journalism in this pandemic. You mentioned those projects uh, in places like Colombia and Peru. And I think it's really an important reminder that it is our responsibility as journalists to ensure that we can continue to report in this critical way. Um, and again, thank you to uh, Mr. Butler, who had to leave us into the ministry for introducing this initiative. Um, Now we are going to have some inf insight, as I mentioned earlier, from experts and key stakeholders in the field who are working to combat this issue and, and working on ways to do so. And we have our key expert for us uh, today uh, joining us, Dr. Sylvie Blion. She is the director of the uh, Global Infectious Hazard Preparedness Department at the WHO, the World Health Organization. And uh, she is the leading WHO expert uh, on the infodemic. So, uh, Sylvie, it's very nice to have you with us. And uh, who better to ask this question? What is an infodemic? Because it's a word that we're using and perhaps some people are not familiar with. So what is an infodemic and how do we know uh, if we're in one? I think your, your mic is still muted. So, yeah, great. So good afternoon or good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to talk about this very important subject, which is the infodemic. So for WHO, infodemic is a tsunami of information, some accurate, some not, that accompanies uh, an epidemic of disease. And we see this with every epidemic, whether it's Ebola, uh, influenza, yellow fever, Zika, you always have an infodemic. And uh, but uh, the issue is with COVID-19 is that this infodemic has been um, unprecedented and probably it's because now information is spreading also through social media. And so um, it's, it's really um, 
a, a problem that we have to manage because you you cannot eliminate infodemic you have to manage it and and this time with covid 19 uh, it has been particularly harmful um, uh, for many people for instance um, in uh, iran at the beginning of the pandemic there was this rumor that uh, methanol was a cure for covid 19. Uh, in reality it's a poison but uh, we have seen a few hundred people dying uh, from uh, this uh, methanol and so that's why it's very important to better manage infodemic not only because it can cause direct harm to health and even kill people uh, but also because it undermines uh, the trust in in authorities public health authorities uh, in science in in expertise and and also in government and uh, we know that trust is absolutely essential to deal with an epidemic or a pandemic and so anything that undermines trust also undermines the response to the event. Sylvie, you mentioned that example from Iran. We have a lot of people joining us from the Global South. So how important is fighting disinformation in the Global South and how dangerous has some of that disinformation been to this point in the pandemic? Yes, yeah, so, so it's it's very important to um, manage this information because uh, to, for us, first we, we differentiate misinformation and disinformation. Uh, even if the impact is probably the same, but it's it's different because you have different solution. Uh, misinformation is really an inaccurate information that is spreading. Uh, but disinformation, uh, it's uh, inaccurate information, but that is spreading with the intent of harming people. And so it's very different. Uh, but misinformation, it, it's very common. Uh, we can call it fake news, rumors, or, or there are many names for this. And, and misinformation is, is really damaging uh, health. Uh, for instance, um, in an epidemic of, of yellow fever a few years ago, there was this um, um, rumor that if you take the yellow fever vaccine, uh, you uh, cannot drink beer for one week. And so we have seen after this rumors spreading that um, uh, people didn't want to get the vaccine anymore. And, and so this misinformation has really an impact because then a life-saving intervention like vaccine uh, people may refuse vaccine because they are afraid of, of this. So um, the, the current ecosystem in which we are living, I mean, the information ecosystem we are living is, is very, uh, there is a lot of opportunity because then uh, you can spread news much faster than before. But there are also some challenges because uh, uh, indeed uh, misinformation also spread faster. And also that uh, everybody has a role to play in it. Uh, because everybody nowadays is producing information and consuming information. So uh, it's not only um, anymore the, the problem of, of media who are really transmitting information, but everybody has a role to play in it. So we need to learn how to work together and manage together misinformation. Uh, what role does social media have to play in all of this, especially in the global south? Because you talked about the role that media has to play working together with people to make sure that the right information is being disseminated. But uh, social media is obviously, there are so many platforms and it's very difficult to control. So what are the challenges there and, and how do you approach them? So first of all, I think what is very complicated nowadays is that um, um, uh, approximately 50% of the world population has access to internet, so to social media as well. And uh, that most of us then, uh, we live in two worlds. We live in the virtual world and the physical world. And the two worlds have some connection. And so this is what makes things uh, more difficult uh, nowadays. Um, and, and so uh, the virtual world in itself uh, has its own rules and its own uh, challenges. And, and this is uh, why it's so important to um, um, increase first the resilience uh, uh, to uh, misinformation uh, in, in every country in the world and, and teach people how to manage information on social media. Uh, for example, uh, uh, stop spreading uh, um, uh, information if you are not sure about the source, uh, always verify the date of the information um, and, um, and try to stop uh, rumors, uh, if you see some, by not uh, 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 sharing uh, this information. So there are uh, some um, uh, rules and, and attitudes that are um, uh, very useful to, to stop misinformation on, on social media. But also, more importantly, I think it's very important to increase healthy literacy of people. 
because uh, this pandemic showed us that it's very important also to uh, have some concept about health. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we see a lot of health inequity in the world, but uh, there is also a lot of health literacy inequity in the world as well. So we need to work really uh, to increase health literacy everywhere. Perhaps to follow up on that last question, on the other side of the coin, do you believe that social media perhaps also provides you, for example, at the World Health Organization, an opportunity to be able to, to reach more people with that correct information? Absolutely. And that's why uh, I said we need to work together. Uh, I think it's very important to have um, strong partnerships, especially during crisis, because thanks to uh, media, social media, I mean, all those uh, uh, sources of information, there is also an opportunity to spread accurate information more um, efficiently first, uh, because we can use also uh, uh, videos or visuals that really help to distill the science. And, and this is what matters most uh, in times of pandemic. Uh, but also, um, it, it can spread uh, more rapidly. And uh, we can also adapt the content uh, to a different context and settings. So I think it's, it's, um, that's why partnerships are, are really important. And social media have been very useful uh, with, uh, during this pandemic. At least we have had a, a very good relationship during uh, this pandemic with, with most of the media platform because they, helped us to overcome a certain uh, nasty algorithm and to push uh, to people more trusted uh, information and evidence-based information. Sure. We saw early on in the pandemic how many people were sharing images and, and videos on how to wash your hands correctly, for example, and how to keep yourself safe and what social distancing means. But to drill down on what you just said, you know, I know that the WHO at the moment is trying its best to debunk any false information out there and elevate the correct information, as you said, and it's an effort from everyone. Yet it seems like... Uh, both mis and disinformation, and thank you for um, identifying what those both are, that they spread perhaps faster than the, the actual, the real true information. So how do you go about that? Well, it's true, and especially um, it spread faster during crisis because uh, epidemics are characterized by fear and uncertainty, and people are more vulnerable to uh, misinformation during crisis because they are more fearful. And so this is why it's so important to uh, not only look at information, but we need also to look at emotions. And, and this is uh, what we have done is develop tools to listen to people concerned, especially online, and to uh, identify not only the, the, the concern they have, uh, but also the emotion. Are they fearful? Are they anxious? Are they angry? Or what is their uh, state of mind so that we can uh, propose them information that really meets uh, their needs at this point in time. And so, and I think this is where we have to all learn how to better uh, dialogue uh, with, uh, with communities and, and with uh, civil society to better understand uh, what are the concerns at a given time and help everybody to uh, fight uh, misinformation and disinformation. Sylvie, one more question before we move on to the next part of our program. Um, do you have a message to journalists in particular? We're here today to talk about the importance of free and independent press and disseminating the right kind of information. What could journalists do better to make sure that uh, media literacy is improved, but also that the right information is being passed on? Yeah, I think media have a really very important role to play during those crises because they are able to distill information and emotions as well. And so I think this is why it's important for media people to understand that they, they have a, a great uh, power, but also a great responsibility uh, and to deal with emotion and uh, information. And so I think it's, it's important to um, uh, work also between crises. Uh, they need to uh, build the trust before the crisis so that during the crisis, they become the most trusted source of information and then uh, it's very important that uh, during the crisis, they can continue to spread good information uh, to the people who are really listening to them. 
Very interesting, Sylvie. Thank you so much for that really insightful look at why sharing and taking this on together is so important. And you'll be joining us in that panel discussion in just a moment. So we'll get to talk a little bit more with the other guests as well. Um, but first, we're going to take a special look at some projects that in the field that are part of this initiative, the ministries initiative uh, in partnership with DW that have just gotten started. And they will continue to be developed and expanded upon uh, over the coming weeks and months um, with the DW Academy. So. Uh, Let's take a brief look. Communication in the rural regions of Latin America is a major challenge. Community radios reach far-flung areas. This is especially important for indigenous people. Luis Salazar is a producer for the community radio station Cepra in Bolivia. One of the challenges most grand in this stage of quarantine for COVID-19 ha sido poder hacer la asistencia técnica tanto a nuestras radios como a las radios comunitarias que han solicitado nuestro apoyo. No estábamos preparados, entonces hemos tenido que utilizar el internet y también hacer control remoto de sus máquinas y poder asistirles. The Transparency and Media Freedom Initiative is developing a new digital newsroom so that information can flow securely even in times of crisis. Information that is also vital for refugees, like Hibo Mohammed, a community reporter for the Sikika program in northern Kenya. With Corona, it has separated family and friends. Uh, it has created economic imbalance. It has also led to some uh, stress and trauma, creating that scaring feeling to almost the refugees here in the camp. The pandemic has shown that vulnerable groups are the first to be excluded from information sharing. Therefore, in the future, authorities, journalists, citizens and non-governmental organizations are working together in a network. In the crisis communication chapter, trained teams communicate quickly in all directions in the event of a crisis. In this way, information is disseminated in a variety of ways in exchange with those affected. In Jabba, a village in Jerusalem, the Palestinian NGO Pialara is building a center for media literacy supported by German Development Cooperation. The driving force in this process is Hania Bitar. She wants young people to be able to use media in a competent way. To get empowered, to accomplish themselves, and to fight and advocate for their rights. In the pandemic, social media have become even more important. But they're also part of the problem, the infodemic. In the Interactive Media and Information Literacy Center, young people and their families learn to use media critically and to evaluate information correctly in order to curb the spread of dangerous misinformation. كيف أنشر إشي على الفيسبوك على المسنجر على المجموعة أي خبر أبايز للخبر المتحيز والخبر لا. Life-saving information goes viral, so future crises don't stand a chance. Okay, great. We just saw there how these initiatives are starting to take off. As I said, they're going to be continue to be developed over the coming weeks and months. But let's talk more about how some of these media development projects, uh, how they work and, and what some of the challenges are. And we have these wonderful guests who you see on your screen with us. Uh, and I will start by introducing, first of all, Hania Bitar, because we just saw her uh, in that video. Uh, Hania is the Director General of PLARA, uh, the Palestinian Youth Association for Leadership and rights activation, and also um, partner of an AI project called MIL Goes Viral. So Media and Information Literacy Goes Viral. So Hania, welcome. Uh, we'll move on now to Dr. Joki Chega. She's the director of the Innovation Center at Aga Khan University in Kenya, joining us from Nairobi. Very good to have you with us today. We also have Gulmina Bilal Ahmad with us, uh, the director of Indiv Individual Land in Pakistan and she's joining us from Islamabad. And she's also the partner of an AI project as well called Constructive Journalism. So we'll speak to her a bit about 
constructive journalism indeed. And uh, Dr. Sylvie Briand is back with us from the World Health Organization. So we can have a really uh, dynamic discussion here. We're going to get started with the discussion, but I want to remind everyone who is joining us, who is watching this, that we want to hear your questions as well. So in the chat function, you have the opportunity now to put in your questions and uh, they will be looked at by our team, a DW team, and they will be gathered and uh, sent over so that we can put these questions directly to the ladies who are on your screen right now. So please don't hesitate, um, start firing those questions away and I will bring them um, into the discussion, uh, which we have about uh, 20 minutes for a little bit longer. So um, looking forward to getting started, ladies. And Hanya, since we just finished with your project, let's start with you. Um, you had once said that media and information literacy is a way of life. So why is that? Why is this so important? Well, um... Media and information literacy is very important. And in order to understand that, just imagine yourself giving uh, your car to your kid to drive in the streets without having a license or throwing yourself in the ocean and trying to swim and you don't have the skills to do that. So media and information literacy, it's really a way of getting a set of skills like uh, the ability to analyze news and information the ability to have critical thinking, the ability to research information in order to be able to sail safely in the digital world. This is a world full of excellent potentials, but also full of hazards. So if we don't really equip people with those life skills, then really the, the, the results are dangerous. And uh, we are proud as uh, a Palestinian organization to be actually a major player, not only in Palestine, but also in the MENA region when it comes to media and information literacy. So uh, with the help actually of Deutsche Welle and UNESCO, we have managed actually to, um, to, to create uh, hundreds of young Palestinian pupils through the uh, cooperation with the Palestinian Ministry of Education. We entered more than 50 Palestinian schools and we have been working for several, ye several years with young people, mm -hmm. uh, 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 enabling them to really acquire those skills. And then during the pandemic, actually last year, those kids just came to the front with their uh, awareness raising videos, with the webinars they held with their peers and with their friends in order to, to spread correct information related to the pandemic. That's excellent. That's really interesting, um, Hania. And Gomina coming to you because Hania just told us about the one side of that equation, which is uh, teaching people media literacy and how to um, identify when news is correct. The other side of the equation is obviously media and journalists. So what how is this current crisis, to what extent has it showed us that reporting needs to change or the way that we approach reporting such a crisis needs to change? Um, thank you, Sumi. I think uh, uh, at the start you said that information saves lives. I would like to add that uh, information sometimes uh, disrupts lives too. And we saw in the, in the uh, pandemic uh, different people were using their coping mechanisms to deal with it differently. There were some of us um, who, who, were, who were running after home remedies. There were others who were looking at the body counts. But there were a lot of them, um, citizens, who, uh, with, because of the anguish and the despair of the news cycle, um, started avoiding the news. And, and we saw a great increase, particularly among young people, of news avoidance. Um, I think uh, this is an opportunity for, for the media to come in and focus on the human citizen-centric aspect of the issue, to come up with, with, uh, with solutions. And that is why we as a media development organization in Pakistan are focused on constructive journalism. Listen, all of us know what the problems are, the challenges are. We live them every day, particularly the media, because there's, there's of course, now there is um, there, there is COVID-19. But let us not forget, for countries like Pakistan, we had our feet to the fire with the war on terrorism. 
So this whole psyche of the media consumer and the media itself was based on a sort of, you know, breaking news phenomena. That has, that has to change now with the pandemic. And then tomorrow there might be another crisis. So we need skilled media who present uh, ev uh, evaluated solutions to the, to, the, to the media consumer. The media consumer has to feel as if he or she is part of the solution. You, you, if you constantly bombard me with issues, with problems, I am going to distance myself. There is a cognitive dissonance that is created. So we need focused solution journalism. But okay. let, me, let me say that um, solution journalism is not the same as solutions proposed by journalists. This is not an invitation for some journalists to present their half-baked uh, sort of vested agendas and push it forward. We, we want local solutions. We want solutions that give us insight and empower the consumer to actually be part of the solution. Right. Okay. Thank you, Glamina. Joki, I saw that you were uh, nodding your head in, in some portions of what Glamina was just saying there. So tell us what solutions-based journalism, what that means to you and, and the at the Innovation Center, what you're working on. Um, thank you, uh, Sumi. So in my view, I think solutions-based journalism um, really refers to that collaboration um, of journalism between um, you know, the news media organizations, the journalists, and the audiences. Um, because for a very long time, we've been having a situation where, you know, the media is, you know, speaking down at, you know, the audiences, telling them this is what you have to do and all that. But things have to change. Um, with COVID-19, we have seen um, our newsrooms shift significantly. And even the way we tell our stories has completely shifted. And what we do at the Media Innovation Center, we uh, support young uh, journalism entrepreneurs from Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania um, through coaching, mentorship, and a small startup grant. But really what is important is that we are supporting them to tell the stories that have not been told in so-called mainstream legacy media uh, for a very long time. So we are looking at a lot of stories about young people, stories about minorities, um, stories uh, targeted specifically to the under 35s, um, stories about women. Um, these are the chronically underserved pockets of the audiences that have never seen their stories published um, in the mainstream media. That is the base of solutions journalism, where people who have never seen their stories being told in the mainstream legacy media, finally see their stories and actually participate in the storytelling processes. Over and above telling the stories that have previously been untold, we're also exploring uh, multimedia storytelling. We're exploring um, technology, leveraging on uh, augmented reality, for example, leveraging on digital technologies. Uh, that is really speaking to the younger audiences in the language that they understand. So we are moving away from the traditional television, print and all that, and moving into very new digital spaces that uh, even sometimes, uh, you know, this mainstream media have never tried before. Thank you. Hmm. That's very interesting, Joki. And Sylvie, that it brings me right to you because we just heard Joki say there that they are working on messages, messaging that um, di directly speaks to young people. So the question to you is, how does the World Health Organization try to craft messages that can reach essentially as many people as possible and relate to as many people as possible? We still have you on mute, Sylvie. Thanks, me for the question. Um, and indeed, I mean, uh, WHO is a global uh, and global agency, so it's not easy for us to uh, adapt messages. But fortunately, uh, we have 150 uh, country offices and regional offices as well, and we work very much with partners like UNICEF, UNESCO, IFRC, and and a lot of um, local NGOs as well. Uh, because for us, uh, we we look at uh, the evidence and we make uh, evidence-based recommendation. But of course, those recommendations then needs to be adapted to the context. And we have, um, uh, for example, young people. We have um, uh, launched a design lab uh, 
uh, where we have discussed with them the key uh, information that uh, needs people need to know to protect themselves uh, against COVID-19. And the young people have translated it into their way of seeing the world and, and those uh, recommendations. So then it's much more adapted uh, to the language of the young and, and also the visual and things that speak to them um, and so that they can uh, really um, uh, use this information for themselves. Okay, that's a key point, adapting a message so that it can be applied in various different ways. I'll just remind everyone who's joining us again that um, please do put your questions in the chat and we will be reviewing them and bringing them into our discussion. Um, Hania, coming back to you now, because we looked again at that video of the beginnings of the initiative that you uh, have launched. What challenges do you anticipate along the way as this uh, is developed? I think we have you on, on mute as well. Okay. Uh, actually, when it comes to, uh, I think with the pandemic, um, we, we really realized how important it is to really fight misinformation and disinformation. And uh, the, the, the current, actually, uh, global crisis response by Deutsche Welle focuses a lot on how to really save life via information. Now, um, in, in the Middle East or MENA region in particular, you know, um, there has been um, projects developed to really help people fight misinformation and disinformation. And uh, the, the thing is that um, we have to really, uh, what is special about the approach is that um, it really uh, comes in time, and I think many of the speakers mentioned this, that it is actually tailored, uh, tailored to the needs of the people. So both projects in the MENA region actually um, uh, uh, again, pay special and careful comprehension to the needs of the users. So it's very important to understand what people want, how they want it. And the second thing is how to involve them in producing solutions. I think with the, with the digital revolution, uh, people really became part and parcel of the whole process. We cannot just now have this up-down approach of enforcing solution. You have to bring people into solution making in order for them to ad adopt it and adapt it and really feel ownership. Now, despite all this and despite all the efforts, there are still lots of challenges. And I speak mainly about actually the MENA region. Maybe it applies to my colleagues in their context in Africa and other contexts as well. But um, actually, when it comes to the Middle East and North Africa, we have to really be aware any intervention <coughs> by Deutsche Welle, by any other uh, agencies, they have to be aware of two main challenges. The first challenge is the eye. Uh, somehow, actually, there is this kind of uh, glorification of the eye. I know it all. I am actually uh, uh, sort of like uh, blessed by certain, you know, like I'm untouchable. Um, nobody can harm me. So unfortunately, you know, we have this cultural tendency or deficiency, which makes people really like uh, uh, believe in themselves and not listen to others. And this is a challenge when you want to, to pass on accurate information and so on. The other challenge, has to do with the issue of trust. And I think actually Dr. Sylvie mentioned this. So in, in the MENA region, uh, we have a problem. We, we don't trust the government. We don't trust the opposition. We don't trust the media. We don't uh, trust the international community. And uh, this also like uh, brings more chaos when it comes to how you deal with information related to protecting right. yourself. So this is why we have to really know how to deal with those challenges in any intervention that is uh, uh, applied to the ground. Okay, very important point there, Hania. And I'm going to start bringing in some of the questions that have been um, sent to us from our viewers, because I think we can all uh, touch upon them. So these are questions that for, are for all of you, but perhaps, Gulmina, since um, we would talk to you next, you could pick up this question if you see fit. Um, the first one that we're seeing here is, if we are not very disciplined as a society and disinformation is spreading faster than any measures against it, 
how can we create uh, a greater and quicker impact? So what types of innovation or innovative ideas do you think are needed? And we can go around the, if you guys, uh, if each of you want to say something um, perhaps somewhat brief on this question, you're welcome to. I think I, I, uh, I think as a global society, we are very disciplined whenever there is self-interest involved. Just consider this, just consider this. Uh, all of us painstakingly research the efficacy of each vaccine. F is Pfizer, Pfizer the best? Is AstraZeneca the best and all? Do we really, with the same vigor and enthusiasm and with the same critical mind, do we really examine the news that, that carefully? This is a question that I leave, leave to the audience and the, and the panel. We need strong media systems to combat this disinformation. And we, when we are as individuals motivated, when we believe that it would affect me, my family, my friends, we are very much motivated to, to address this. Uh, the only problem is that we are so attuned to, to, to firefight that when something like the pandemic, which is a slow boiling crisis, which deepens every day, we are not attuned, we as consumers, as citizens, and our media, as media professions, we are not attuned, we are not skilled to address it. I believe that we, the strong media system is the vaccine, and we need, uh, that needs to be administered daily, and the fight against disinformation, against misinformation, against myth-busting, needs to be done uh, daily with booster doses of two things. Uh, one, and that's just my opinion. One, uh, uh, citizen-oriented, skilled, trained media personnel. In a country where I am speaking to you uh, from, Pakistan, the citizen has to set himself or herself on fire in front of the national uh, parliament in order for, for them to be heard, in order for their problems to be highlighted. Where is the media? Where, why is not media representing me? And we heard from, from, uh, from our good doctor from the Aga Khan University of how there's this almost condescending way of the media talking down to us. It's not representative. And that is where, uh, in, uh, where, where journalism like solution oriented journalism, constructive journalism comes in. Um, okay. The other booster that we need is, is what Hania is working on. Uh, a critically aware media information literate uh, citizenry. Right. Thank you. And and I might just move on to the next question because uh, to make sure we can address all of the questions that are coming into us. So Joki, perhaps I'll put this one to you um, because it is directed to everyone. How can fact-based reporting be encouraged in challenging political uh, situations? And um, this viewer mentions Tanzania as an example, uh, without putting journalists themselves at risk. So perhaps um, you have a perspective on that. Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, just to um, circle back on the question that you're talking about innovation, I think the pandemic has given East Africa's news media another chance to prove their value in society, but also a chance to think on their feet. Um, we are seeing local news media organizations like maybe Nation Africa um, coming up with very creative campaigns about you know, putting on your mask, washing your hands. And also now they have invested heavily in digital and um, they consider mobile their primary publishing uh, platform. We also have some of our partners in Uganda, like uh, the Media Challenges Initiative, that um, have you know, translated COVID-19 prevention messages into almost 15 local languages. Now, that is what we talk about impact in the society. But going back to your next question about how we can prevent um, disinformation and protect journalists um, when they're doing their jobs, I think a lot of training needs to be done. Um, through a structured continuous professional development program where journalists are, you know, trained on issues like sensitive reporting, uh, you know, media law, for example, um, just digital safety and all that, and even fact checking. Because a lot of challenges that we are having right now is because there's that um, knowledge gap between journalists and the work that they're supposed to do. And this is where we come in as academics and we call for 
partnerships between the industry and the academia and institutions, global institutions like WHO, that these journalists need to be given a lot more training than they already have. Newsrooms need to be um, you know, empowered not just with knowledge, but also with resources. And this is where um, I would call on our policymakers and governments. What are they doing to empower local news media organizations and even community radios and community-based organizations such as the ones being run by some of our partners in this call? What are they doing to ensure that they fight fake news and disinformation? Because right. fact-checking is expensive good journalism doesn't come cheap yeah like you know you're a journalist you understand that yeah thank you thank you Joki. and and sylvie the next question is actually directly to you um the question that's being asked is because of the pandemic governments have limited the freedom of journalists so what has the who been doing to tell governments about their vital roles during this time which you know Joki was just talking about there <laughs> uh, Thanks. Yes, yes, we have seen that um, uh, on one hand, uh, in, uh, the infodemic has had a lot of impact on society. As I said, it has undermined the trust on, in government, in, in, uh, in experts, in science and so on. And the reaction has sometimes be to uh, uh, silence the decent voices. And, and we have tried to convince government that uh, we, we cannot eliminate the infodemic, we have to manage it. And part of the good management of infodemic is, is really first to listen much more to people. And, and when some journalists are expressing a certain opinion, especially when it comes from uh, opinions from the population, it's, it's important to listen to those opinions and to um, uh, respond to concern in a timely manner as well. And for instance, uh, let me take the example of vaccine. Uh, there have been a lot of concern uh, in many countries about the new vaccines because those vaccines were developed very fast. And so it can be seen as a fantastic opportunity, uh, but also people were worried about those vaccines. Maybe it was too fast, maybe they are not safe enough. And so these are, in my opinion, legitimate concern and, and so it's very important to answer those concerns through dialogue, uh, through uh, active listening to the population concern and not uh, uh, stop the voices that are raising those concerns. So um, I think the, the new uh, information ecosystem is very complex. Uh, as we already mentioned, there are lots of uh, misinformation and disinformation uh, in, in this uh, new uh, ecosystem. Uh, but the way to manage it is, is not to uh, silent uh, uh, the voices of, of journalists, but rather to learn how to have a constructive dialogue and to listen to each other so that we can uh, really have a true communication. Thank you, Sylvie. And as we're running a bit out of time, um, honey, I'll put this question, it might be our last one uh, to you, if we can keep it somewhat brief if possible. How do you think governments and news organizations and also, also public health um, institutions and organizations can get past filter bubbles in social media to make sure that we reach a broader public uh, with this messaging? Um, well, actually, um, uh, certainly um, uh, it is very important, you know, in order to make sure that information, correct and accurate information reaches people we have to really search and look and listen and see what people trust, what are the mediums or the platforms that people listen to and trust. And for example, in our context, and this might differ from one context to the other, people in the MENA region somehow trust, first of all, local community leaders, not the big uh, political leaders, but local community leaders. And this means that we have to really uh, uh, empower local community leaders and the media surrounding local communities in order to transmit accurate information. Second, we discovered that people in the MENA region uh, trust actually uh, social media influencers. Lots of people believe in those influencers. So if we use those influencers to pass across the, uh, the accurate information, this is also another way of reaching out to people. A third yeah. a source that um, people trust somehow are people with white robes. So 
So people love doctors, nurses, and religious people who wear white or black sometimes. So information right. through them is also like reaching out to, to people. So we have to look as, at other venues beyond the official uh, bubbles transmitting information because now people have different sources of how they get information, whom that they, they trust, and whom they listen to and whom they decide that this is like really trying to mislead them into different direction. That's a really important point. And it actually answers one of the other questions that had come up in our uh, chat, which is how to confront the lack of trust among young people as well. I will ask one last question and it's gonna be a lightning round. So I would ask really just one quick sentence from all of you. What is your biggest priority for media to emerge stronger from this crisis? And honey, we finished with you. So perhaps uh, just one quick sentence from you and then we'll go around. No, start with the others, I will finish. <laughs> okay, uh, well, Gulmina, we'll start with you then. That sounds fair. Hadia will get more time to think. Uh, <laughs> um, I think the biggest priority is what what uh, what Dr. Sylvia said. Um, in such times, India needs to pre present itself as the citizens' ally in order for for the, for the trust to be built on on media. And trust can only okay. I will only trust the media if it's skilled, if it's trained, and if if it is me oriented. Right. I have to keep it to one sentence. I'm sorry, everyone. Joki, you're next. <laughs> so my big sentence is investing in public media to ensure that um, high quality and independent journalism is available to everyone at no cost. Well done. <laughs> Sylvie, it's your, your turn <laughs> Thank now. <laughs> you. Thank you. Um, I would say that uh, build trust before the crisis, because during the crisis, it's, it's very difficult. So. Perhaps it's even too late. Yes, indeed. Okay, and Hania, you have the last word with the last sentence. Well, I, I totally agree with the issue of trust and acknowledge whenever you go wrong, just admit it and regain people's trust. This is very important to play a big role as, uh, as media. Admitting mistakes, also important. So thank you very, very much, Hania and Joki and Gulmina and Sylvie for that really interesting discussion. I think you brought up so many points that we can all take with us, whether you're a media practitioner or not. Um, for more information about this initiative, you can go to the website for the DW Academy. I believe that the, the link for that website will also be in the chat here uh, that you see in the live stream. So if you need access to that. Thank you again to the ministry for hosting us. And um, don't forget the annual Interdisciplinary International Media Forum from DW. The Global Media Forum is going to take place from uh, June 14th uh, and on June 14th and 15th, rather. So make sure you sign up and get your digital pass for that. This will also be a topic there. So we can continue the discussion on that end. So again, that wraps us up. Thank you, everyone, very much. And uh, we hope to talk to you again soon and meet again.